So we'll continue looking today at how people tried to search to find meaning and stability in their lives, um, and especially in politics and economics and international relations, um, and during the interwar years. And then we'll look at how the Great Depression kind of comes along and crushes that and everybody, and some attempts at um, reform during the Great Depression to make it not so terrible. So uh, one of the major cultural aspects of this time is the rise to dominance of movies and radio. And movies and radios become quickly the dominant form of mass culture in this time, uh, replacing the newspaper and <clears throat> and plays and other things of that sort, because it's more uh, democratic and that everyone has access to it. Uh, and they use these as kind of a way to distract from the daily struggles of life. Is you can go immerse yourself in this story in a theater, or you can listen to the uh, the radio shows, and, and that will distract you from the harsh realities of your everyday life. Um, and so the movies become really important. One of the most famous uh, movie actors of all time is working at this time, Charlie Chaplin. Uh, you have silent films, and then you have what are known as talkies, which is where people are speaking. Uh, and the radio really kind of gets a, a takeoff when uh, Guglielmo Marconi uh, proves that you can wirelessly transmit information all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, sending a signal from... Uh, the coast of Great Britain or Ireland all the way to uh, Canada, Nova Scotia. And so this changes things and radio suddenly becomes way more popular because it's proved to be practical. It can be used. Um, three fourths of households own a radio by the 1930s. So it becomes really widespread very quickly. And in addition to being an entertainment tool, governments very quickly realize that they can put their own programming on there and it will, it will reach most of their population. And so they eventually end up using it as a propaganda tool, as a way to support the war effort or drive home ideas of the New Deal or whatever it may be uh, to really prop up what the government is doing. So we've got that going on. And, and I'll point out that it's not just the radio, but movies as well. In this era, before movies, there would have been newsreels, and governments will often kind of propagandize those newsreels uh, to show what's happening and kind of rah-rah the country around. So those two... Uh, those two mediums become the dominant form of mass culture at this time, both radios and movies. Uh, it, but amidst all of this kind of search for meaning and self-searching that we've kind of looked at in the last week or so, there is also really underlying all of this some major political problems. Uh, specifically, it kind of all it kind of all gets to the, the root of all these problems is this idea that the Treaty of Versailles doesn't satisfy anybody. Uh, Germany hates it, and we'll explain why a little bit later. France does not trust any of their, quote, allies, so they feel isolated, and they're really fearful of Germany still, uh, despite the treaty. So that's a problem. Um, Britain is going back to their splendid isolation, where they're going to worry more about their overseas colonies than they are about things on the continent, because... As World War I proved, things on the continent are really messy, and the British people aren't really in interested in being involved in that in any capacity. The United States is going back to isolationism. They, they kind of broke out of their shell for World War I, but now they're wanting to kind of return to themselves, and again, we'll explain why in a minute. Um, and communist Russia is in turmoil. No one's really sure how that communist experiment's going to turn out, and no one's really sure that they can trust communists. So... In Europe, you just really have this, the major powers are super untrusting of each other. Uh, there, There's just this kind of uncertainty that permeates all these international relations. And on top of that, international trade had been super disrupted because of German U-boats just sinking everybody. Um, <clears throat> and it continues to be disrupted after the war because there's not the same uh, flow, there's not as much access to raw materials, there's not the men to sail the ships, there's not the people to buy the goods, there's not the money to buy the goods. So uh, that's kind of all leading to problems. And, and again, going a little bit deeper into those, the Treaty of Versailles was problematic in two ways. It, it, it was not harsh enough to where the, to keep the Germans from ever rebuilding right like it did not completely wipe them out it wasn't quite that harsh although it was like really harsh um 
but it was too brutal on the German people that they could ever forgive and say, yeah, you know, we, we kind of deserved that. Like, we'll, we'll own that. We'll take that. Um, we get it. So it leaves the Germans in these places where they're kind of just smoldering and the resentment is festering and, and there's a lot of anger just kind of boiling up in Germany. Uh, so we got that kind of problem in the in the east, at least. Um, France finds itself really trying to enforce this treaty, like, hey, we signed this treaty, we agreed to it, let's let's make sure everyone follows it. But they are really the only country that's pushing for that, and they really end up pushing to uh, implement the harshest portions of those treaties. And that's in large part because, again, of this fear of Germany. So they're really wanting to, like, no, they can't have any military. No, they have to pay these reparations. Da 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 da, because they're so afraid of Germany attacking them again. In the United States, the treaty is never ratified, and that's Wilson's kind of Woodrow Wilson would uh, admit that that's kind of his greatest failure. And he goes on this long campaign to try to get it ratified. He ends up getting super sick and dying because he's put all his effort into this. Um, but the Senate never ratifies the treaty. So the U.S. never actually signs the Treaty of Versailles. They end up concluding a separate peace. And so they're not interested in in pushing these harsh reparations on Germany. Right? That's just not, we didn't sign it, like, whatever, not our problem. So um, that's one of the elements. Britain quickly realizes that, you know, before the war, Germany had been their biggest trade partner because they were also really industrialized and had the money to spend. And now they weren't and couldn't spend any money. And Britain's economy is going to suffer because of that. So Britain's not super interested in, um, in continuing to punish Germany. And one of the, uh, the voices that kind of garners a lot of sympathy and support, especially amongst the British, is from the British economist John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes had actually been at the uh, Paris Peace Conference and he walked out of the Paris Peace Conference because he said that this treaty is too harsh. It's going to ruin the economies of all countries. It's not doing anybody any good. And he, in protest, he left the, the Paris Peace Conference uh, because he saw how, how terrible it was going to be. Um, and again, he argues that it's going to not only hurt Germany, but it will hurt all other countries uh, far beyond what they had expected. Underlying all of this is a great British distrust of France and their large army. France kept a large army in the field because they didn't trust Germany. Um, and Britain doesn't trust France because, they're, if you recall, there's a lot of animosity and a lot of history between those two countries. So you've got this undercurrent of distrust. So France ends up looking for new allies and they settle in on Poland and other new Eastern European nations like Yugoslavia and Romania. And they do that, and again, in order to keep kind of Germany in their pinchers, like now we're still facing this potential two-front war. Um, they're not allying themselves with the Soviet Union because no one knows what to think about the Soviet Union, um, but they keep that alliance to keep Germany in check. Within Germany, obviously the most problems are faced, uh, and one of the biggest ones is paying these reparations. Actually, the biggest problem in Germany is this payment of reparations. They had to pay 132 billion gold marks, which is 33 billion U.S. gold or U.S. gold dollars. And I emphasize the gold; it's on the gold standard, right? So they have to pay in in gold, not in any other like components. And so that's um, that's a really harsh condition. And they have to pay 2.5 billion gold marks per year. That's not money that they can just kind of come up with. That's money that they actually have to have on hand in reserves. Um, and so that's really a problem, and it's super difficult for Germany to do. And this young Weimar Republic is unable to do so initially. And um, they try their best. They make their first payment, but they're not able to make any future payments because their, their economy simply can't handle it. Uh, and so countries like Britain would decided, like, yeah, you know, it's okay. Like, we get that you have to rebuild your country and your economy. Like, just take a few years and then pay us back in a few years when you're able to. But France, being still super angry about the Franco-Prussian War and distrusting Germany, says, no, no, we're not going to do this moratorium. You need to pay us now. And when Germany says, we're not able to, we're not going to, France takes action. And what they do is they send their army into the uh, most industrialized part of, of Germany, the Ruhr Valley, 
Uh, and there, they're going to basically occupy it, collect taxes from there until they've decided that they're satisfied with the payments made from Germany. Um, and this is kind of putting everyone kind of in an uneasy spot because that looks a lot like an invasion of a sovereign nation. And it's not really... People aren't really interested in going to war again, obviously. They just got out of this great war. Uh, and so Germany kind of goes to protest and they have all of their workers in the Ruhr Valley stop working. Uh, France says, we're not leaving here, so fine, you guys will all starve. You know, you may not be paying us, but you're not getting any work done. You're not encouraging your economy. So there's this big international standoff and everyone who's watching it is like, this is absurd. Stop. We need to fix this. Um, and eventually a compromise is reached and uh, that compromise allows um, allows for progress to be made and the compromise is the Dawes plan and the Dawes plan um, really kind of fundamentally shifts the way Europeans are dealing with these reparations and so they decide they're going to look at the reparations payment that Germany has to make and um, and this is an international committee that decides this uh, and they're going to look at these reparations and they're going to uh, adjust them based off the economic prosperity of Germany that year. So they'd have to pay some percentage of their GDP in these reparations, but it wouldn't end up being like anything that would cripple their economy. Uh, and then Germany would receive private loans from the United States. So United States bankers are able to make loans to Germany, and Germany could take that money to pay off their war debts to Britain and France, and then Britain and France could use that money to pay back the United States for the loans that they had taken out during the war. So what they've created is this kind of circular <coughs> economic like system where money's just flowing all around the world. And it's the same money that's being used to pay down multiple debts. And because this is so complicated and like not super good economics, not fundamentally sound, it can only really work for a limited time. And of course it ends up falling. Um, but it, it kind of resolves the immediate problem. In addition, there's some political uh, political agreements that are made that kind of bring some sense of stability. And one is in Locarno, Switzerland, and France and Germany agree on a border. They agree um, that they're going to kind of try this peace. Uh, and then Italy and Great Britain, in an attempt to kind of put both France and Germany in check, say, look, we're not going to make an alliance against one or the other. We're going to basically make an alliance that says, if one invades the other, we will attack the aggressor nation. So if France invades Germany, then we're going to attack France. If Germany invades France, we'll attack France. And so this is kind of an effort to tell both of them, to both those countries, France and Germany, to stop acting like children and to figure out how to participate in the international community. And then, uh, born out of kind of this spirit of cooperation, is something called the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Uh, and what it is, is it's, I guess you could kind of see it as a continuation of, of um, Wilson's goals of creating a system that would prevent future wars. And this is a pact that 15 nations signed that says basically war is terrible, war is evil, we, will, we, we won't stand for war. Uh, the problem is that it doesn't have any teeth. Um, and it makes no provisions for what should be done in case of war, uh, but it's a step in the right direction in terms of promoting peace throughout Europe. Um, so you kind of have, amidst all of this turmoil, there there is some sense of international cooperation towards uh, the mid to late uh, 1920s that really kind of people can see, okay, like we've stepped back from the brink of the second war. Uh, maybe there's a chance that things could get better here. Um and so that's going on internationally, but nationally there's also some issues uh, within each country. And um, democracy kind of wins out in most nations and it's put to the test. Uh, Germany experiences major struggles in the 1920s as we talked about in terms uh, specifically of their economic struggles. And so people are dissatisfied with the ruling class. Um, and all these struggles, plus series of political assassinations, which were popular in the early 1900s, um, leads to a near collapse of German democracy. And we had looked earlier about how uh, kind of there's this mini revolution after World War One in Germany that leads to um, the socialists almost gaining control, but the moderates kind of bringing it back. And that trend continues. Um, moderates really rule this government 
recognizing that they need good relationships with the rest with the West in order to ensure economic prosperity, and they need economic prosperity in order to secure like good livelihood, pay back the reparations, and to like move their country forward. So Germany ends up kind of sorting things out and and settling on a middle uh, moderate ground. But despite all of this, there's still a real strong undercurrent of far-right nas ultra-nationalist groups in this country, um, pro-monarchy groups. And this it's during this era that uh, Adolf Hitler creates, does what's known as the Beer Hall Putsch, which is where he tries to overthrow the government from Munich and, and fails, but ends up writing Mein Kampf. So that streak is not just unique to uh, Hitler. That's, there's a lot of far-right super-nationalists in Germany at the time. Um, and on the same side, there's a lot of far left communist influence people who saw what happened in the Soviet Union and really want to replicate that. So you have kind of those competing ideas, but Germany ends up settling on a fairly moderate, um, fairly moderate central stage. France is in, is in even more turmoil. Uh, they have large groups of socialists and communists that battle for the support of workers Eventually, they create a unified front during the Depression, but uh, in the immediate post-war years, uh, France is kind of in this struggle where communists and socialists are both, both pushing for control. Moderates are trying to gain control, but moderates have lost a lot of their reputation because of the way the war was conducted and because of France's kind of struggles in the war. In addition to that, the, the currency in France, the franc, took, some, took a major hit on its value. It dropped to like one-tenth of its pre-war uh, value eventually it climbs back up to one fifth, but when you take your, you know, your life savings and it's suddenly only worth twenty percent of what it was before, you're going to be dissatisfied with the government, and you may look for change. And so there's a lot of turmoil there. Uh, despite all this, though, France becomes kind of the main area, the congregation point for the huge number of American expatriates in in Europe at this time. And so you have a real cultural hotbed developing in uh, Paris, especially in terms of jazz and music and art, um, really fueled by American culture that has been brought over and then uh, kind of nurtured and grown in Europe. Uh, Britain is kind of the one that comes out of this most unscathed. They continue to move towards full equality, uh, and they, they're able to very... I mean, they face a huge problem in that they have large numbers of unemployment, something like 20%, um, because industry is damaged, there's no trade partners, there's no need to produce things, and so they have to solve that crisis, and the government does a, a great job of providing um, unemployment assistance and uh, disability assistance and increasing pension, and so... The people are very satisfied because they don't feel like their life is meaningless. They feel like their government is going to take care of them. And so we see this this general shift in Great Britain away from um, the old classic liberal ideas of competitive capitalism and government disinvolvement um, and a move towards more of a kind of a kind of a modified socialism, right, where um, the government's role is to take care of its people. And so that's a real shift. And the conversation in, in Britain really looks significantly different now than it did before the war in that anyone's ideas of uh, limited government control, individual responsibility, and kind of total capitalism, that doesn't exist in, in British politics after the war. Uh, there is a real shift towards embracing social ideas. And then... Uh, they're dealing, they've been dealing with the problem of Ireland for a long time. So finally in 1922, they just kind of shoot off and give Ireland uh, full autonomy after kind of a brutal little guerrilla war that, that's fought over there. So Ireland is free. Of course, with progress, then comes the Great Depression. All of that progress and all of the kind of glitz and glamour of the 1920s was just masking the underlying problems. Um, and the Great Depression is a term that really refers to the economic slowdown and total market collapse that lasted from 1929 to historians put the end date at 1933 but in some countries it lasts all the way through world war ii and the global economy really never fully recovers until world war ii um so that's the kind of main kind of meat of what the great depression is it happens for a number of reasons 
Uh, there have been a lot of warning signs. Global trade was slowing down. The markets simply weren't there. Um, but the immediate cause is the collapse of the American stock market in 1929. Uh, that leads to panic everywhere and banks recalling their loans. But that happens because there's kind of an overinvestment in stocks instead of like farms and industries and actual means of production. And so there's a lot of speculation with money rather than investing in like concrete goods. And a lot of that money that is invested had been borrowed. And so people didn't actually have the wealth that they kind of seemed to have on the outside. They owed a lot of that to the banks. And so um, when the tides of the economy turned, there's real panic um, real panic because these people have to pay back their loans very quickly um, and so all of this leads to a severe economic slowdown and panic in the United States that then quickly spreads to the rest of the world because you remember these American banks had made loans to Germany they had made loans to other countries to rebuild as well and so they start calling back those loans saying hey you know that money we let you have yeah just kidding like we really need that back and so uh, they, they call in all their loans. And so those countries scramble to pay it back and they're unable to do so because their economies have failed as well. And so you kind of have this perpetual cycle of like failure of economies. Um, and so quickly nations panic, they freak out and they shun the idea of international economic cooperation and they put up protective tariffs uh, in order to protect their national industries. Right, like, well, we're not going to allow you to import British cars because, um, you know, the Brit the American car manufacturing is so low that we can't afford any competition. So, no, no, any cars that come in will have like a fifty percent tax on them. And so, these protectionist tariffs really discourage trade, which is a real problem. Um, it needs to be encouraged rather than discouraged. And so, this leads to this cycle of of failure that eventually uh, continues to get worse and worse. And the Great Depression is really a terrible time. Uh, and part of the reason, there's two major reasons that historians would argue for why this lasted so long. The first is that there's no international system that kind of helps regulate the economy. Like, hey, protectionist tariffs, not good. Remember, we moved away from that after the colonies. Um, so that's one of the big problems. There's no international economic cooperation um, and the other one is that a lot of governments initially cut spending uh, to rein in their budgets to deal with these um, immediate lack of funds, when really in order to solve this, they should have increased their spending and done what's known as deficit spending, spend more money than you have right now. It would stimulate the economic recovery with the idea that eventually you would earn that money back. Um, and so those problems lead to the Great Depression lasting longer. And what we see is massive unemployment around the world. This, again, continues to shake the foundation and the faith of people um, in, their, in their government, in themselves, and who they are. Like, who am I if I can't have my job? And so there's a lot of questioning that arises um, out of this. So some of the attempts at recoveries. Uh, in the United States, you have the New Deal programs, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that because that's American history, um, and you'll learn about that at some other point. And this is AP Hero. But these New Deal programs are essentially uh, government-sponsored programs to support, uh, to put people back to work and to, to provide assistance to those not working. Uh, Scandinavia has, the Scandinavian countries, so Sweden and Norway uh, and Finland, have the most successful response to the Great Depression. Uh, and the, there's a number of reasons for that. The first is that they kind of already had social reform legis legislation that had been passed that protected peasants and workers. But they also develop a, a unique form of socialism that's unique to Scandinavia because culturally they have a long, long tradition of kind of cooperation and working for the greater good rather than for the individual good. So they're able to kind of adopt this socialism without feeling like they're making massive social changes. Uh, and so what they do during the Depression is they use the large-scale deficit spending for public work projects and to hire public workers. Again, what would have helped a lot of countries. Um, they increase old age pensions and unemployment insurance uh, and take care of the people that way. And then they subsidize housing. So they help pay off housing or get people into new housing. Uh, and then they increase maternity allowances to allow you know families to grow 
without feeling like they're being punished because they're not making money. Um, so this whole process keeps Scandinavia from being hit super hard by the Great Depression. Now it does require high taxes, uh, but despite these high taxes, both private and cooperative enterprises grow. So even though initially there's like, oh man, we have to pay a lot more taxes, but the end result, the long term, is everyone's making more money. Everyone's quality of living gets higher. Uh, and so this kind of Scandinavian socialism becomes a, a model for other nations to follow as this midway point between extreme unregulated capitalism, which people felt had gotten them into this mess, uh, and communism, which everyone was scared to death of. So the Scandinavian model became kind of the best one to follow. Uh, in Britain and France, you have kind of a little bit different. Britain shifts their focus away from international market and more to domestic markets. Uh, again, in part because they want to keep, they can't trade overseas. People have these isolationist tariffs up. So that's part of the reason why they do it. Um, but also in order to kind of make their people in their country happy by giving them the goods they need. They lower interest rates on housing to create a housing boom that allows people to buy more houses, that creates construction jobs, appliance jobs, furniture jobs, everything that goes with new houses. Um, and so they shift their focus away from kind of old industrial revolution industries of textile and, and iron and things like that to new industries of automobiles and other more high-tech manufacturing. And so they allow these new industries to grow in Britain. Uh, in France, the Depression lasts longer than most anywhere else, and that's that's in large part due to the political turmoil uh, that prevents a coherent strategy for dealing with the Depression uh, from ever taking root. Um, and, and there's just constant turnover in the government, constant turnover in politics, and so no one's really sure what's going on. A real fear of right-wing fascists uh, leads to this kind of alliance between communists and socialists known as the Popular Front, which is very successful in the elections. Um, and so they end up taking control of the government and they model the recovery efforts after the New Deal in the United States and what Roosevelt had done. Um, but they're met with huge resistance from the large fascist movement in France, from the right. And so there's just political bickering, political dissent, nothing gets accomplished. And so for years, France is stuck in this quagmire of, um, of the depression. And they kind of are the hardest hit, besides Germany, uh, of the countries in Europe. And so that's where we'll leave it right now, where although there had been some progress in international cooperation, this depression really kind of shatters any pretext that that uh, progress could continue. And it leaves countries kind of grappling to deal with self-identity problems.